bad character of a defendant. Why is the possession of a firearm by a convicted felon? Why, why is that already in, before the jury? That wasn't bifurcated? Your, your Honor, I'm sorry. How many times has this man testified in a trial? How long has he been an, I know he's a retired investigator. How long has he been an investigator? He knows he is not supposed to say that, Your Honor. As a sanction for this having occurred, um, that's the end of the testimony from this witness. There's going to be no more testimony from him. So he's done. Thank you. Can you all hear it all right now? Can you hear me? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we hear you. Did you hear you? Man. If you're new, make sure y'all hit that notification bell, that like, share, comment, and subscribe. Grab a seat. We finna dig deep. What's up, YouTube family? Welcome back to the channel. Man, oh man, we gotta talk, and we back with another huge update in this young thug why it's a Rico trial. Now, one of the state's key witnesses, a former detective whose name has been floating all around this case, is officially out of the courtroom. And when we say out, that means he's kicked from the courtroom and also kicked off the case. After having a massive slip up in front of the jury, ask yourself, is this the nail in the coffin for the prosecution's case? Did trying to be famous just go wrong? Would a state star witness actually just put a dagger in the state's case? Man, before we dig deep, as always, y'all definitely tap that like button, subscribe to the channel if you're not subscribed, and definitely tap that notification bell so you don't miss these drops. Y'all ready? Let's dig. How does, is it, I guess it's just Mr. Dennis at this point, former investigator Dennis, okay. Or retired detective Dennis. Retired detective Dennis, okay. Anyway, let's get the jury in. Good morning, investigator Dennis, how are you? Good morning. When you were here previously, um, you testified about your involvement in the investigation of the shootings that occurred after the death of Donovan Thomas. Do you recall testifying to that? Yes. All right. And again, during that period in 20, 2015, did you work with your partner, retired Sergeant Gaither, to assist in solving some of those shootings that occurred after the death of Donovan Thomas Jr.? Yes. As a member of the gang unit, when you first learned of the shootings that occurred after Donovan Thomas Jr. passed away, did the gang unit or yourself immediately begin investigating those cases as retaliatory shootings? Yes. How did the gang unit recognize or realize that some of these shootings were in retaliation of the murder of Donovan Thomas? Usually it was based on the victims of the shooting. Okay. In the first days between January 11th and January 19th, were there homes that were shot at that were either family members or friends of Kenneth Copeland. Yes. Excuse We're, me. I'm sorry. I believe the microphone may not be working. Not not yours. Yeah. So. The witness mic. The witness uh, mic. You just Thank pull you. it closer to you. No, it wasn't on. Oh, I don't know why I did. But can y'all hear it all right now? Can you hear me? Oh, okay. Right. <laughs> Where were those homes primarily situated? Throughout the city. Um, we had them popping up all throughout uh, Atlanta. Okay. Were there specifically were there homes on Hendricks Avenue that were targeted in the days immediately following Donovan Thomas's um, murder? Yes. And the addresses that were associated with those homes were that was that 193 and 197 Hendricks Avenue. Yes. Also, was there a home of Mr. Copeland's sister, 878 Oakland Drive, that was targeted as well? Yes. Um. Without saying what any of the officers told you, just how did it factor into your investigation? We basically gathered information as they came in, and pretty much every night we had a different shooting, and we were tasked with investigating it. Okay. Outside of Kenneth Copeland, were there, did you learn of other homes of individuals that you all associated with YSL members, their family's home being shot or targeted? Yes. Um, what, was, what was one of those addresses? Ruby Harper. Okay. And whose home um, did you identify that home belonging to? A family member related to it, Mr. Williams. And were you ever able to associate Mr. Williams with that home specifically? Yes. How did you do that? Uh, I pulled his driver license picture. Were there any particular social media pages that you all went to or that you saw that informed your investigation? Yes. Uh, what were some of those um, pages? Uh, immediately after the death of Donovan Thomas, there was a fake uh, Instagram, I believe, page created death to snake inwards and from that it was almost like a play-by-play -play of what was going on or uh those associated with mr thomas they basically were sending threats and exp telling John what the yep i have a rule that's the evidence rule that's evidence rule 
best evidence rule. Oh, sorry, best evidence. Um, do you have? I do. All right. Did you ahead. did you collect or did you all collect some of those posts? Yes. Using music as a part of your investigation, gang investigations. Um, in my almost ten years in the gang unit, uh, we investigated countless different gangs, gang members, music, literature, social media. Um, like I said previously, nothing was off limits. Um, we and music, like I said earlier, a lot of times we weren't investigating the music. We were investigating the crime and the music came up or someone made us aware of a song that referenced something in reference to the crime in which we was investigating. And as you heard those music, as you heard those songs, how did you then use that as a part of your investigation? That helped uh, understand sometimes why a retaliation happened or were they taunting a rival or were they highlighting something that they did or something like that? And that helped us investigate what we were doing. And how often over your 10 years of being a part of gang unit, would you say music came up in your investigation? A lot, like a percentage? Yeah. I couldn't even, 75% to 100%, I don't know. Okay, and have you ever had the occasion to teach on how music and gang culture about music and gang culture. Yes, I think I said last time I had a presentation that I talked to other investigators and students about hip hop and gang culture and how they go hand in hand. And how many times have you done that presentation? More than 10. More than 10. And just tell the, tell the core a little bit about what you talk about in that pre presentation. In the presentation, I basically use movies, music, and show through entertainment how in the African American community, they can be brainwashed through entertainment and how gangs has been pushed on the African-American community through entertainment. I think I referenced last time the movies Boys in the Hood, Menace to Society. I didn't know what a blood or a crip was until I saw Colors. All of that is through entertainment. The same thing with music. But of course, in my years, through my training I, and my own background, I was able to decipher a song, decipher movies and entertainment and understand what's being said. And through interviews with individuals involved in our investigations, a lot of them would help us understand some of the music and some of the lyrics that they were saying. So let's talk about the use of song lyrics. Now, in this trial, one of the things that actually happened was a major event with the previous judge when Georgia Supreme Court actually overruled the actual ruling with the use of lyrics in the trial. But the previous judge actually overturned and continued to go forward with the use of the Young Thug's lyrics in the YSL Rico trial. Now what's interesting, it's almost like we're back to square one because again, we're back where we started talking about the lyrics and we're back on stand with the same witness that we've seen, what, one, two, three, four, Five, four or five times at this point. But ask yourself this, were that judge's ruling on the previous use of letting the lyrics in on this case actually backfire on the state at this point? Let's dig. All right. Can I proceed? Yes, please do. <laughs> um, so understanding the court's, the court's ruling in regards to Detective Dennis not being able to testify about uh, subliminal messages or anything like that, um, and just going really to the basic issue of what he was qualified uh -huh. for, um, I, I'm just going to take my direction from uh, the transcript that was uh, thankfully sent to us by uh, Ms. Pressfield, as well as the, the court's um, actual order. Um, let me say first that um, the Daubert hearings were held initially back in December of 22, but I uh -huh. think Detective Dennis, if I'm remembering correctly, was one of those who we weren't able to do then, so he may have been in 2023. Okay. That, that notwithstanding, um, I don't have any recollection of the detective being uh, questioned or talking about his ability to interpret lyrics as part of his expertise. Uh -huh. And so if we're relying on what the court um, ordered, what the court ruled, I look at page six of, of the court, as, I don't know you have it in front of you. I do. Um, the court's order, um, which was drafted by, by the state. Um, it, it's adopted by the court though, so that's right. really neither here nor there. Go ahead. Right. And, and so um, I just know that there is nothing in there where he is qualified uh, to testify about anything in regards to any lyrics, in regards to inter interpretation of rap lyrics, nothing in regards to his training um, or his qualification thereof. So um, we'd maintain our position that he is not qualified to testify okay, about well, what the state intends to qualify. To, to qualify. I thought that what y'all were looking back at was the live stream of the Daubert hearing. We couldn't find it. Okay. Well, the order on page five says that Detective Dennis also quote, has extensive experience in evaluating their social media and communication practices, unquote. So if nobody can answer for me one way or another what it covered, and you maintain that you don't think it covered this, or you don't know what it covered, I'm happy to just have him come in here and let's hear his expertise on that and go on with it. We're fine, because we, right. we, we, we do not accept that when the court says communication patterns that they're talking specifically about rap lyrics. That's our I don't. I don't know. Let's get him in here. If nobody can remember. And we don't have a transcript. 
Uh, yeah, I need the detective, please. And Ms. Hilton, did, did either of y'all handle the Daubert on this witness? No, Your Honor, and what he was qualified in is a gang expert, and I, I am positive he talked about how music, how gang members use there? music. Were you I was, there for I was it? Present. Okay, and, and how, is this from your memory? This is from my memory, how music can play a role in gang promotion, how music can play a role in gang, um, in the promotion of the gang, and that is what we're talking about. We're not talking about lyrics and musicology, but how does, oh, in fact, how does music play a play a role in the, in the gang? Do you recall the Daubert hearing November in, involving you yes. in this case? Yes. Do you remember whether you testified to um, your expertise and experience in terms of looking at lyrics and songs and yes. using those in your? Yes. Gang investigations. Yes. Okay. Given that, I'm going to... Anybody want to voir dire him on, on that topic? Not his expertise, but whether he, in fact, testified about that already in the Dalbert hearing. Yes. Can I say yeah. that? We talked about lyrics the last time I was here with the halftime song, me and uh, Mr. Adams. Also, the last time I testified, the second time. Is it going to be anything beyond that? That type of... Same type of testimony? No, that's, that's it, Sharon. I mean, it is... How does the how do gangs use music? Period. What, what's your question going to be? Um, whether or not he is qualified to do any interpretation of uh, music, uh, rap lyrics, as relates to his expertise in gangs. Not not whether or not um, uh, he's familiar with communication patterns of gangs, but specifically whether he can look at a particular rap lyric and make any interpretation about what that means to 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 gangs, specifically in regards to this case. Is that something that was already covered in the Daubert hearing? Yes. All right, we're not going to recover it. I mean, I don't have any reason to not believe this witness. Understood. Okay. Ms. Persfield has received the rough of the Daubert hearing, so she's going to send that out to everybody. And if it's already resolved, then it's resolved and we can all just go to lunch. If not, we'll stick around here, do that little bit of a Daubert hearing, and then go to lunch. So just give us a few seconds, or, well, a few minutes. Uh, Detective Dennis clearly testified about lyrics and understanding what's going on in the music and it maybe just meaning something to the average listener and other people to other things to members in a gang so that's page 16 uh well what i'm looking at is page 51 but I, this this was covered and he was qualified so i'm satisfied now let's talk about the stage witness now, the state's witness is actually up on the stand, and I'm at this point confused on whether he's an expert witness, a fact witness, or just the state's witness. But one thing for sure is that the state has been using this actual witness in different sections of this case, and now it all makes sense. This actual witness was here just to help paint and shape the state's narrative. But what's even more interesting is, is this witness an actual expert on lyrics? Now. Nah. He may be an expert, as he says, on gang affiliation or the streets or whatever he did in his previous work history or prior work history or even current. But an expert in lyrics? Now, what's interesting, because what we're about to see is the defense actually shred all of this apart. And this is where the state's narrative actually started unraveling. Is it safe to say that the state had a horrible day yesterday and an even worse day today? Let's dig. <sighs> I want to hone in specifically on your training, right? Sure. Um, I heard you say that um, you've given a presentation uh, about gangs, but I'm asking you about gangs and specifically rap music and rap lyrics as it relates to gangs. What is this presentation that you've given, and are there any literature, is there literature or any material that you have that you can share with us that you've used in this presentation? I don't have the presentation with me, but in the presentation, it's my own accumulation of entertainment, music, and presenting. I present to kids, I present to adults and other cops, and educating them in the gang unit. A lot of Officers don't understand what's happening right before their eyes. And so for myself, I was tasked with educating not only our department, but other departments uh, when I worked for the ATF, the, them as well, as well as students about this information. What literature specifically have you used to educate either yourself or other investigators in, rega in regards to the relationship to rap and rap lyrics to gangs? You mean, when you say literature, you mean like books or are you yes, talking sir. about magazines? I'm or? talking about books. I'm talking about learning treatises. I'm talking about studies, anything like Training that. Training materials. None of it. No. I, magazines, um, 
we might use books uh, from other officers. From uh, I've read a book out of Compton. Um, I think it's a lonely day in Compton or something, and it was written by uh, gang detectives out of Compton because a lot of gang they they were privy to a lot more information than we were in their own work over the years. Right. And what specific information? Here's what I'm trying to get to, detective. I'm really not trying to not trying to trick you or anything. Okay. But but I, I want to know specifically: Is there a book? Is there a training manual that specifically deals with rap lyrics? Uh, as as it relates to gangs. No. Okay. Uh, you referenced before, um, I think you used the words, my own background is used to decipher um, this information. You talked about movies. Mm -hmm. So are we talking simply about you looking at the movie Minister Society? Yes, yes absolutely. Yes. Right. Looking at the movie uh, Boys in the Hood? Yes. And you're saying that that is what you have used to form your expertise in regards to rap lyrics and the relationship between rap lyrics and gangs? What I'm saying is, Based on my own upbringing, growing up in a gang-infested environment, my own education, my own training, as well as watching these said movies is where I formulated my opinion. Have there, other than what you yourself have experienced in your own personal life, right, uh, have there been any, for example, instructors, professors, or anyone else who, has, who have taught you um, using material or lesson plan in regards to the relationship between rap lyrics no. and gang? No? No. All right. Those are all the questions I have. Anybody else? And then has a part of what you have done, um, how does that intersect with what you know about gangs? What? The music and the lyrics. From listen, I'm a rap fan myself. And from listening to music and watching movies, videos, YouTube, I'm able to understand what is being said and what is being expressed. Um, of my life, it's just like watching anything, I can understand it. And by me being a gang investigator, a regular person might listen and think it's art. And it may be art, but for myself with my education and my background and investigating gangs for a number of years, I'm able to understand exactly the message that's being uh, um, kind of, what's the word I'm looking for, it's, that's being given. Um, I can't even think of them. But I understand when someone says, I caught somebody down bad. To you, you may look at that and say, oh, they caught somebody down bad. But for me, that means you caught somebody and you were able to hurt them, kill them, or what have you. So I'm able to decipher what is being said. A regular lay person does not understand that. They look at it as just art or a lyric in a song. Okay. All right. Once again, I'm satisfied that based on his training and experience, um, he can testify as an expert as to... Um, Maybe a double meaning within rap lyrics. Your Honor. And it's obviously ultimately going to be for the jury to determine whether they, you know, and believe and accept as credible anything he or any other witness says. Yes, sir. And, Your Honor, that, that's, that's my, my issue. I understand the, the court's ruling. I just ask you to, to consider uh, what he has testified to. He has no specialized knowledge beyond the ken of any, any layperson. I, I understand his saying that he, what he grew up around. I grew up in Brooklyn, too. Uh, and, and maybe there are members of the jury who have the same experience, life experiences as him, but that's not what the purpose I of I understand. I'm not basing it just on where he grew up. It's right, his, but, his training and experience as a gang investigator. On, but specifically in regard to the interpretation of rap and rap lyrics as it relates to gangs. He has not given the court any information whatsoever to indicate that he has any specialized knowledge that will qualify him as an expert, such that his opinion could go to the jury for them to look at his, him as an expert in that field. None whatsoever. And, and I'd, I'd maintain my objection. I'd ask that he not be qualified in that particular area. All right. I understand. And your objection is overruled. I mean, this just happens to be words that are set to a beat. It's no different. All right. Let's get the jury in here. Now, here's where the case actually took a turn. Now, during the question, this expert, the state's witness, the state star witness, the lead investigator, key investigator, made a major error. He casually mentioned that one of the defendants, Yak Gatti, is actually a convicted felon in a picture with a gun. Boom. The moment those words came out, the courtroom went silent. You can feel the tension through the defense actually rise in the courtroom. Now, the defense did immediately jump up and get on it, objecting like their lives depend on it. And honestly, this slip up is definitely huge when it comes to this case. Now, here's why this is a game changer. The jury isn't supposed to know about any prior convictions unless it's directly related to this case and the charge. But by revealing that one of the actual defendants is a convicted felon with a firearm, now again, the defense is moving fast to try to get all of this actually struck from the record. But again, and again, and again, how many times can we continue to hear the witness testimony just be struck from the record and erased from the jury's mind? Let that sink in. Mr. Weinstein. Your Honor, this one you cannot fix. 
This is bad character evidence that came in. The state should have prepared their witness. I move for a mistrial. This absolutely cannot be unheard by the jury. It was here heard clear as day in his deep sonorous voice. They have heard it, they have absorbed it. It cannot be fixed. 404A, Your Honor. I'll hear whatever response the state might be able to make on that. Um, Your Honor, that was not the state's intention. We'd, I'm <laughs> sure it wasn't. Um, Your Honor, it, that wasn't even, that response didn't even come across my mind that would, that would even have come out of our witness's mouth, Your Honor. Um, the state's intention was to solely talk about the vehicle that he was standing on and the fact that he was standing on that vehicle. If you can just give us an opportunity just to look at some case law just to see if you Your, can. Your Honor, I'm sorry. How many times has this man testified in a trial? How long has he been in, I know he's a retired investigator. How long has he been an investigator? He knows he is not supposed to say that, Your Honor. I, I would find it surprising if he isn't aware that that's not supposed to come out. Um, I do not believe that the state intended to elicit that. And I think that you actually yourself acknowledged up here at the bench that you don't believe that was the state's intention. I, I do not believe it was their intention. Nonetheless, it happened. Yeah. I'm going to give you all uh, about uh, 15 minutes or so Thank to find Honor. whatever you might be able to find. Thank you, Your Honor. All right. Thank you. Yo, stop what you're doing real quick, real quick, real quick. Hit that like button and subscribe to the channel. It's free. Hit the like button. Share the video. Hit the like button. Let's dig. Why is the possession of a firearm by a convicted felon, why, why is that already in, before the jury? That wasn't bifurcated? It was, it was not bifurcated, Your Honor. Did nobody ask that it be bifurcated? Um, I... I, I... This has been a long trial, and I know you're not asking about my you're not asking about my client's charges. But my recollection is, I asked for my client's charges to be bifurcated, I think we did. and it was denied. Is my recollection. It might be and a, so, it okay. What is the overt act <laughs> that they're convicted felons? That would be weird. I mean, there has to be some reason, but, um, oh, that, 187, okay, 189, okay, which actually then has to change my instruction as to the rest of them, too. Goals 216, um, there you have a case where a seasoned officer testified about bad character of a defendant. Um, the court in that case called for, there should have been a mistrial. Um, it says that when it's impossible for the trial court by corrective instruction to rectify the harm done by improper testimony, a mistrial must be granted. Um, and again, the issue here is you have a seasoned officer, someone with years of experience testifying. And in Posey, I, there's really very instructive language from our courts um, where they say we, we reiterate here I'm sorry, I'm talking too fast. And too loudly. We, yeah, you know what? I'm going to tone it down. We reiterate here what we said in Boyd. It may well be argued that peace officers are not always well acquainted with our rules of evidence and that statements such as the one here are merely inadvertent. I'm going to stop the quote for a second to say something, which is, again, here we have a peace officer. Here we have an investigator who is well seasoned. The quote continues. But if we refuse to reverse this judgment, then we provide no incentive to district attorneys and solicitors to counsel their witnesses, especially law enforcement officers, to avoid extraneous and inadmissible outbursts. It is high time that this court go on record as opposing without reservation such conduct by law enforcement officers. Posey is exactly on point. Posey calls for a mistrial. This officer should have known better. The state should have properly prepared the witness to not issue, to not blurt out, to not state so clearly that my client was just getting out of prison. It cannot be corrected, Your Honor. All right. Um, any last words by the state? Well, actually, never mind. It's the defense's motion, so y'all don't get any last words. Um, all right. I, I think 
I am finding that this was not intentionally elicited on the part of the state. Um, however, I also am finding that this witness as a law enforcement officer should have known better than to make any mention of it. Um, it is, however, significant that one of the charges against Mr. Kendrick in this indictment is that he is a convicted felon. Um, were it not for that, I would grant the mistrial motion. Um, but given that this jury already knows that he's been convicted and is a convicted felon um, anyway, even without this testimony, um, I don't think that a mistrial is warranted. I am, however, going to give a curative instruction. And um, as a sanction for this having occurred, um, that's the end of the testimony from this witness. There's going to be no more testimony from him. So he's done. All right. So let's dig a little deeper and talk about why this actually happened. Now ask yourself, was this witness actually trying to get camera time? And did the pressure of being in the spotlight again cloud his judgment? Or was it just a genuine mistake? Either way, it doesn't look good for the prosecution or the state, especially when it comes to this case. Now this could be the kind of blunder that causes the state to actually lose credibility in front of the jury again. Forget the testimony, give us the notes, and don't even worry about what you thought you just heard that you wrote. Make that make sense. Now, what's even crazier is that this isn't even actually the first time that this happened in the court. Back to back, we're just going to keep on striking witness testimony. Let that sink in. Did this witness play on the case actually just backfire on the state? Now, not only did the judge actually strike the testimony from the record, but this retired investigator is actually permanently kicked out the courtroom and officially off the case. Now, to be fair, we've definitely seen a couple of witnesses from the state over the past couple of days make this trial look the other way. But even more alarming should be the jury's perception of the state. And if you compare the witness from yesterday to the state's witness today, just the difference in the testimony should actually make you question the integrity of the case. So let's dig. Did the state actually just lose this case based off this witness causing the mistake, especially after being sworn in as an expert for the state? Let that sink in. Or did this witness desire for attention and his lack in judgment actually cost the state an opportunity for a conviction when it comes to this case? Either way, time will tell, and it's definitely not looking good for the prosecution. Back to back, two days with L's with your own witness? Make that make sense. Now, for the jury, to be fair, the jury's definitely been through a lot. They've seen witnesses come up on the stand from testimonies crumbling to testimonies not happening to witnesses getting sick. And ask yourself this, what are they supposed to actually think when they actually just sat and witnessed this? Another day that you're going to sit up and say, scratch this from the book and from your mind and your ears, your thoughts, as if it doesn't exist? Let that shit make sense. Now, it's interesting because the defense stayed all on top of it and the state, again, just took another L. So y'all jump in the comments, let me know y'all's thoughts. Did the judge get it right by actually kicking the actual former detective, investigator, whatever he goes by off the case? Or was this just another manipulated play from the state? Now, again, as I said, this witness actually got up here and testified and what he said was a convicted felon on this actual case. Total violation from the state. Now, it's interesting because again, as you sit up and you watch the overt acts, the state is still playing on verbiage because just had they got this one piece in, with that slip in that the detective just got up here and said, a former detective, a state's witness, or expert, gang, whatever he refers to himself as, had they got that piece in, that right there would have sealed the deal for this conspiracy because it only takes one based off this actual act to get that conviction. Man, y'all jump in the comments. Let me know y'all's thoughts. If you're not subscribed to the channel, man, subscribe to the channel. Tomorrow's supposed to be a big day in the court, so y'all know we're going live all weekend. And tap that notification bell so you don't miss a drop whenever we drop. Until next time, remember, the life you save might be your very own. I'm your host, Jay. Phew. Gone.